Okay. Thank you, so Lindsay. Good afternoon, sure. California, from your neighbor to the north. I'm Erin Lagason, and I am the presiding judge of Department 3 of the Oregon Court of Appeals. Uh, good afternoon from your not neighbor far to the east. Uh, my name is Steve Jewett. I'm a county court judge in the Ninth Judicial Circuit in and for Orange County, Florida, not Orange County, California, uh, which is Orlando. Good morning. My name is Doreen Hartwell, and I am an attorney in Las Vegas, Nevada, and we're looking forward to hearing your testimony today. Students, please introduce yourselves. Nice to meet you all. We're Unit 5 from Irvington High School. My name is Arjun Bofer. My name is Zachary Martin. And my name is Archie Dittar, and we would like to thank the judges for being here and listening to our testimony, and we would also like to thank our coach, Mr. Martinez, for preparing us. Thank you. Well, as you know, we are doing question two today. It starts with the Thomas Jefferson quote, a bill of rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse or rest on inference. Do you agree or disagree with Thomas Jefferson? What are the advantages and disadvantages of a national bill of rights as compared to state bills of rights? And finally, what are the differences between positive and negative rights and which are more important to the preservation of liberty? You may begin. During the debates over the ratification of the constitution, the potential inclusion of a bill of rights listing certain fundamental rights retained by the people became a primary issue. Anti-Federalists argued in writings like John DeWitt II that clear and explicit enumeration of rights would protect the people from a power-hungry national government. In response, Federalists like Alexander Hamilton argued in Federalist 84 that the national government lacked the constitutional authority to infringe on natural rights in the first place, and enumerating certain rights would imply the elimination of protections for other unwritten rights. While we agree with Jefferson that bills of rights are beneficial and generally necessary because they safeguard rights even when in opposition to majority opinion, we do not agree that infringe should play no role in protecting people's rights. Even when there is a bill of rights, the government must occasionally rest on inference. Principally, the Supreme Court has inferred that unenumerated rights like privacy and marriage are protected by the Ninth Amendment in the 1960s cases, Griswold v. Connecticut and Loving v. Virginia, respectively, and courts often have to balance rights and define their boundaries while applying them to protect people through common law and substantive due process. In the United States, national and state bills of rights have many variations in the rights they protect. National bill of rights protect the fundamental rights of all citizens in a country, preventing sub-national governments from violating them. The Supreme Court has selectively incorporated national rights since 1925's Gitlow v. New York, which in effect, prevented states from violating their citizens' free speech rights. Although it leads to greater consistency, the difficulty of changing most national bill of rights can hinder progress. Amending the American constitution requires a supermajority of both houses of Congress and the states, a nearly impossible consensus leading to the stalling of broadly popular changes like the Equal Rights Amendment. While a national bill of rights usually remains broad, state bills of rights can protect rights tailored to their interests. Section 34 of Texas's Bill of Rights, for example, gives the right to hunt, fish, and harvest wildlife, which is a local interest. While initiative and referendum systems practiced in California and other states lead to greater democratization, they make changing bills of rights much easier, leading to excessive alterations to state law determined by slim and under-informed majorities. For example, Louisiana has rewritten its constitution 11 times, including protections for the rights of slave owners and state-sanctioned segregation in some iterations. While the constitution includes both negative rights, which prevent government action, and positive rights, which oblige it, negative rights play a larger role in protecting liberty because they comprise more of the constitution and protect the freedoms of expression and conscience, privacy, and other fundamental rights from excessive use of government power. For example, application of the First Amendment's protections for freedom of expression prevented the government from punishing Gregory Johnson for burning a flag in 1989's Texas v. Johnson. Without negative rights, government officials would be able to encroach on liberties based on public pressure or personal inclinations, potentially leading to tyranny. While positive rights help preserve liberty, they are less important because their scope is often limited. 
The Bill of Rights contain a few positive rights within the judicial system to prevent unjust deprivation of natural rights, such as the Sixth and Seventh Amendment's right to an attorney and to a speedy trial by jury. However, most positive rights are non-binding and found in the body of the Constitution or in legislative statutes. For example, Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress the ability to grant the positive rights of national security and intellectual property protection without requiring any action, and programs such as SNAP, Medicaid, and Social Security work to aid certain communities. While negative rights are more important, we must continue to protect both positive and negative rights as both are essential to liberty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for your first follow-up question, uh, what limits, if any, should be placed on the rights of the Bill of Rights and uh, who, as between the courts, Congress, or the, the executive, should place them there? All rights in the Bill of Rights uh, with very few exceptions are not absolute. And the Supreme Court has been the primary mechanism by which our society and government has placed restrictions on these rights. For example, even though individuals have a right to free exercise of speech, sorry, uh, have a right to free speech, the 1969 case Brandenburg v. v Ohio held that that right to free speech is not absolute. And if someone's speech may lead to imminent lawless action, then the government has the ability to prevent that speech and to act against it and punish it. So in, so, so in times of when, when a court, when the Bill of Rights, uh, the courts usually have a precedent to, to determine where, the, where certain amendments are applicable or not. For example, with Tinker v. Des Moines, they determined that the freedom of speech, the freedom of speech in the First Amendment extended to school grounds, or for example, in the Fourth Amendment, Katz v. United States and Carpenter v. U.S. in 2018, the Fourth Amendment was applicable to modern day technology. So a lot of the times the courts determine where on what grounds these amendments are applied and how they're enforced and in what, what realms. All right, well, what circumstances, uh, if any, um, would or should cause a person to lose the rights that are uh, delineated in the Bill of Rights? So within the circumstances of say they committed a crime, uh, in that circumstance, they would be up to the, uh, the, the judgment of the judicial branch and they can be stripped of some parts of their life, liberty and property. But there are some instances where uh, a right to vote might need to be maintained for a criminal in some cases, but uh, for things like the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, uh, in the case of a criminal prosecution, those rights are not as absolute. The underlying theory here comes from what John Locke characterized as the social contract theory, meaning that when we enter a society, we set some mutual agreements on actions. And violations of those actions, as my colleague mentioned, crimes and other things justify taking away certain rights in order to protect the common good of the people. So if someone uh, commits a crime such as a murder, when they are in prison, they have a limited right to liberty. And in some cases, they may even lose their right to life in jurisdictions that support the death penalty. And go going off that, I although being uh, so somebody who has committed of a serious crime, they are likely to be de deprived of some First Amendment rights, such as freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, but the Constitution guarantees rights such as the right to a speedy, tr speedy and fair trial, and also that a cruel and, by the Eighth Amendment, that a cruel and unusual punishment shall not be imposed. So the, so the Bill of Rights does balance those rights, even if somebody is um, going to be deprived of their uh, life, liberty, and property. In your prepared remarks, you um, discussed in, in response to some of these questions, both negative rights and positive rights. With regards to the body of the Constitution, can you identify any positive rights that are set forth therein? Body of the Constitution, as we mentioned, in includes a multitude of positive rights. Uh, however, most of these are, are not binding, such as the ones in Article 1, Section 8, that allow Congress to do things such as create a postal service or to provide for the national defense. However, there are a few uh, binding positive rights on uh, the national government, such as its responsibility through 
Article 4 to protect the state from foreign invasion. You argued in your opening statement that there, there is a, a place for recognition of rights by inference. A counter argument to that would, would be that you can't, the founders didn't include any rights that they didn't mention you know, expressly by, by name. Um, how would you support your, how would you provide further support for your uh, rights by inference argument if you confronted an argument like that? Well, I would say that the original, uh, one of the intentions of the Ninth Amendment was to secure that the rights uh, that were already enumerated were, did not disparage other rights from existing in the first place. It doesn't mean that they can be added uh, to specific points of views, but it means that they still exist to a certain extent. And I, I think that, uh, yeah. However, uh, the use of the Ninth Amendment has been very sparing. And in the rare cases that it has been used, such as 1965's Griswold v. Connecticut, it has been quite controversial with the application of substantive due process in that instance to create a privacy right based on the right to, to liberty in the 14th Amendment through due process. Uh, some justices on the conservative end of the court, such as Justice Scalia, had called it an oxymoron uh, and judicial usurpation. So I think some of these rights that have been created through substantive due process and other forms of inference ought to be uh, confirmed as either codified laws uh, or even stronger if there is the political capital to do so as amendments. So we can protect these rights if the court in later years decides to reverse these opinions. You mentioned um, Justice Scalia and he's been, he's sort of the, the uh, poster child originalist. You know, he always said, if it's not there, it's not there. Um, do, you, do you ascribe to that um, the words of the words and that's what the, the founders meant? Or do you think that the Bill of Rights and the language contained therein uh, is more fluid or should be seen as more fluid uh, to reflect uh, the modern times? I think that as, um, as society progresses and as we get more modern, I think a lot of the times um, the founders, what they said, they, they would not have known that um, we would have technology in modern day. So they would not have made uh, a bill of rights regarding where privacy falls with regards to technology. So I think that's why, um, uh, that's why when we, when, when, when we make inferences or when we make, when the court sets precedents regarding, um, uh, regarding modern day technology, I think they need to be more, they, they need to be more open-minded with their approach and more considerate about how, um, uh, about how things are different now than they were in, um, than they were at the time of the writing of the Constitution. And just as a, a follow up to, a, to um, that question, can you make an argument by looking at the plain language of the Ninth Amendment in support of um, the inference? Well, not that it's an inference, that it's an express statement in the Ninth Amendment that there are natural rights that belong to the people that aren't specifically identified in the Constitution. Yeah, Georgetown law professor Michael Seidman once said that uh, while it does not provide that the Ninth Amendment gives new rights, it does proclaim that they do exist in the first place. So I think, can I finish my thought? Finish your yes. thought. It should be inferred uh, through courts if it were to be a good enough right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So California, excellent job. I really enjoyed listening to your, your presentations. I heard some things that I hadn't yet heard before, um, but I'll, I'll identify some of the things that I thought were particularly uh, strong. It, one, you had a good definition and, and clearly good understanding of what positive rights and negative rights were um, and, and articulated that very clearly um, in response to the question about limits your, your, you identified that the rights are not ab absolute, and then you were able to give specific examples of cases that had, had described the limits on, on the, including, I heard Brandenburg and Tinker, um, you're taking the position that, that um, rights by inference are, are 
a part of it and then defending it by re, you know, re mentioning the Ninth Amendment as a, a source of that, I think is um, a very, one, it's a, just a very strong argument against against the argument to the contrary. Um, somebody at, one way or the other, the Ninth Amendment has to be contended with. It was included in the Constitution. And so it's got to mean something too. But I especially appreciated the comment that, you know, the acknowledgement of the different competing views of how to read the Constitution and the suggestion that of uh, confirming rights through, you know, legislation or amendment and, and, and not leaving things to the court, but engaging the political processes when, when you can would be, um, you know, a measure to take. And uh, it's the kind of thing that makes me very happy that um, all of you are presumably going to be voting soon and, and participating um, with full rights in our, our democracy. Uh, so thanks a lot. Yeah, great job. Um, I, I really liked your, uh, your prepared statement. It had uh, everything in it that it needed to and answered all the questions. In fact, it chopped the legs out from under, underneath me on a couple of the questions that I ask. Um, one of the ones that I always want to talk about, because it's something that I'm interested in, is the difference between the federal and the federal constitution and the Bill of Rights there, and then the states having their own Bill of Rights. Um, and you, one of the, what I like to ask about is, is there a downside? You know, obviously the states are much more nimble. They can come in and make quick reactions to what the political uh, temperature is at the time. And you brought up the fact that it takes forever if if it's at all possible anymore to, to amend the federal constitution. So, but you talked about that in your opening statement. So I was like, well, there goes that question. I had to start figuring <laughs> out where I was gonna go. So it was really good. Um, you hit uh, on several things that I noticed um, that we ask about because other people don't bring up. So you are anticipating several things, the substantive due rights things, it's Aaron's thing, and the ninth and 10th amendment is Doreen's thing. And you guys, you guys touched on that in the opening statements. That was really, really well done. I appreciate it. Uh, excellent job. Yeah, I totally agree with my co-judges. Your prepared um, remarks were, I, I thought, excellent. You covered everything. You answered all of the questions. And your, um, you, and I. One of the things that I really appreciated was acknowledging that obviously there, there are two there are multiple viewpoints to most, most um, positions and you acknowledge that even you took your position, but you acknowledged um, the, the counter position. I thought that was well done. Um, you use lots of um, Supreme Court pre um, precedents to support your position with regards to your various arguments and your responses to all of the questions were um, just that responsive. You answered our questions and you actually did kind of, you, you kind of stole our thunder, so to speak, in terms of some of the questions because you already answered them so well in your prepared remarks, there was no point in us asking them again. Um, and the same, just not to, to um, reiterate what was said, but I, I, I love the, the quote and um, the acknowledgement. I think it was, well, I'm not sure which one um, stated. All of you had just great comments, but the um, quote from Scalia, um, saying basically it's, it's um, controversial with regards to making inferences within, uh, with regards to the Ninth Amendment. And, um, and I thought that was, that was great that you acknowledge that, you know, despite the plain language of the amendment, you know, there's still controversy um, around that and, and um, adding additional rights. I thought you guys were great. Um, good luck as you continue going forward with this competition. Good luck, well you guys. Thank you so much for all the feedback. Thank you.